I'm Caleb Harris with You Can Make This Too. Thanks for coming along to my dream shop tour. So happy to be here. Thank you for everyone who's helped make this possible. The flow, and I'm gonna have time codes down below. First, I'm gonna talk about the turning this whole building from a barn into my dream shop, the decisions behind, or the reasons behind the decisions I made of why I did things the way I did. Then we'll walk through the workflow and how things move through here. And then the next steps, what's left to do. Um, I've kept putting off this video for a few reasons. One, I don't like to be all braggy about what I have. I'm very blessed and fortunate and thank you to everyone who's enabled this dream to come true. Two, I want everything like in the pristine, this is the way it's gonna work before I show everyone. But the, uh, the reality is this is, besides my studio and workshop, a full-time commission workshop, which funds a lot of what I do. So the work doesn't stop coming just because I wanna do a tour video, but sponsors deadlines also don't stop coming. So. This is where we are. Let's uh, talk about making this place happen. Another reason for this is I've done about a dozen videos on the individual processes. So if you want a deeper dive into any of the things we're gonna cover, probably got a video on that. The playlist will be linked down below. But for this, I wanna try to trace the footsteps of the very first intro tour, hopefully overlap some of that footage so you can see the transition in this. Here's my side door where we came in, where we started. This was one bay and this whole side of the shop was split into three separate areas, sort of rooms. There was a wall about here and a wall about here. On the opposite side of the shop, the room, which is now my office, was a tack room. And the this was two horse stalls with a wall split down the middle, breaking this into two areas that were still dirt floors even. So of course the first step was just demoing everything, getting all the walls out, um, cleaning up, power washing all the metal because this was just an open pole barn with exposed metal. After we got that done, we were able to get the spray foam in, which was quite an adventure, as well as get the slab poured in here. We did this slab by hand because uh, I didn't want to have to pay for a pump truck. I wanted to be able to do this on my own timing and just sort of come back and show I'm not afraid of hard work, even though I've been very blessed and have a very equipped shop and can do almost everything the easy way. I haven't always been that fortunate and I'm still not afraid to roll up my sleeves. But with that, there are a few things I learned in the comments. One is if you have to do a big slab like this, but you can't get a truck in, there's this really cool thing called a Georgia buggy or a concrete buggy, which is a little motorized cart that you can have a concrete truck come fill up. It's like a wheelbarrow on steroids and then dump all, all your ready mix wherever you need it. That would have been handy. Now the spray foam is one of the few things I wish I'd done different in this shop. I went with three inches of spray foam. I went with spray foam um, for all the reasons one goes with spray, spray foam. It creates a tight building. It's a very good insulator. And one of the reasons it insulates better isn't that it's R value is inherently a whole lot higher, but that it creates an air seal and a vapor barrier. So you remove all the air leaks that exist. Now I do know that with fiberglass properly installed, you can get very close to the air seal that you can achieve with spray foam, but that's properly installed. Um, had a lot of issues with the contractor and the whole install on that. In retrospect, I would have installed it myself if I'd known the headache I was gonna get into and the fact that there's so few installers around here to work with. Um, the reason I didn't is the price is about the same going a DIY route versus a pro route. And I figured, hey, if it's the same price, I'd rather have a pro come in, knock it out in a day or two and have it done right. That is not how that went at all. Uh, so in retrospect, I wish I'd just done it myself. But again, that's a whole other story. But what I would have done different there is instead of doing three inches of spray foam, I would have gone the flash and bat route, which is a two inch spray foam. One and a half inches of closed cell spray foam gets you a vapor barrier. So two inches would establish a good vapor barrier, get me up to about an R14, and then filled out the rest of my six inch thick or five and a half inch thick wall cavity with bat insulation, which would have got me around an R25 value. Right now I'm about an R21. I'm not really concerned. The R21 has been great. We had a huge winter storm come through and the shop held in just fine. And I'm sure we're gonna be fine this summer. But what I didn't realize is I wanted to do these roughs on walls, which I'm so, so thrilled with how they come out. Obviously we, you know, framed in the interior and then put up all this roughs on lumber, which is a whole lot of work. Very cool video on that process. 
What I didn't realize is the spray foam, I've heard a lot of people talk about how good of a sound insulator it is, but really that's just a matter of density. I was really surprised when this building was just foamed in, it echoed more than when it was just metal. So what I inadvertently created between that hard layer of foam, an air gap, and then this roughs on, roughs on lumber on top of it is an excitement chamber where when sound goes in there, it just bounces back and forth. And uh, it's basically a drum. So if I'd done a little bit less spray foam, taken the cost savings on that, and then invested in bad insulation, which probably would have been about the same cost, I would have had a bunch of fiberglass in that excitement chamber to quiet the building down a whole lot more. As is, it's um, not causing any problems except for my mini splits hanging on the outside that shake the walls. Um, whenever you're outside this building and we have everything running, if it's closed up, you can barely hear anything. I just don't want to disturb my neighbors, not that they're close. And also because this is a studio first kind of, and then a wood shop, um, you know, sound quality is very important. So to help mitigate that and all the hard surfaces in here, another thing that was really big was the ceiling treatment I went with. So we have three inches of spray foam on the ceiling, but then I came behind that and to help cut down on the echo, I installed four inch thick fiberglass, non-face fiberglass insulation, and then covered that with burlap um, the reason for the burlap is just to keep all of the insulation from raining down on us, pr provide a good cover, but also something that was very porous that sound would easily travel through um, because I was really trying to cut down on the echo and I was afraid even with just a paper barrier was going to reflect high frequencies. Didn't want that happen, wanted something totally transparent to sound so I, that way the sound could go up through the through the fiberglass, hit that foam, bounce back, and go back through the fi fiberglass and get muffled a lot. To also achieve that, you can see on the ends of my buildings where the burlap is, it doesn't follow the crown of the building and I kind of box those in with the burlap. In those corners, I piled in a bunch of insulation on a diagonal to create a base trap to help absorb the low frequencies which accumulate in corners from my dust collector and all these larger machines that I have. Also, you'll notice on the ceiling, I have a lot, a lot of light. Uh, each one of these is 9,000 lumens. I have the link below. There's 29 of them in here. So it's somewhere around a quarter million um, lumens of light total. I want to say we're around 240 foot candles, which is about the same amount of light recommended for inspecting aircraft. Um, so it's a lot of lights, very bright, which is very good for filming and just for woodwork. I'm never having to worry about putting a spotlight where I'm working. And because I zoned all the light, it's really fun for videos because we can play with um, where we have light, where we don't have light, create some dramatic effects. So that's a lot of fun. And also with that end of cutting down on sound and making a very comfortable space to work in and also just aesthetically pleasing, a lot of decisions were I wanted to create a space that inspired me to come in here, made me feel creative where I want to be in work, not something that's just like, uh, that's where the work is, I gotta go do the work. Where I'm in here, I'm, I'm, I love to just sit in here and take in this space. So with that is also this floor. This is a Husky floor from Home Depot. It is not an anti-fatigue floor, to be clear. However, like walking on this is still a lot better than walking on concrete. I'll get some anti-fatigue max. But what it does do is it's very chemical resistant and oil resistant. It's very non-slip even when sawdust kind of piles up, this floor doesn't get slippery. And what I, they said that it helped with sound, which was one concern because it was still bouncing a bunch of sound off the seat, off the floor and the walls, but not the ceiling. But I think it's the texture on this floor and just the material that it is, it's PVC, absorbs sound really well. There's almost no echo in this space, which is pretty unreal considering I've got hard walls and hard surfaces everywhere. But between the ceiling treatment and this floor, it just kills all the sound. It can't just keep bouncing around, which is super awesome. And one question that came up a lot about the floor was, but how do things roll on it? Cause I roll stuff around my shop a lot. I do too. Small wheels get a little bumpier. You see this also cart from Husky has some larger wheels. So it bounces a little bit, but the wheels are large enough that they mostly roll right over the bumps without a problem. So no issues rolling stuff in the shop. And again with that, these have a little bit smaller wheels. So a little bouncier, but they still roll just fine. Obviously all this equipment requires a lot of power. So we have a dedicated 200 amp service down here, which is fantastic to have. Never have to worry about running any or popping breakers. Power all over the place. Whole video on that, really detailing it. A few notes, these drop cords are absolutely gold. I have two of them, one here in the main area, 
another one over here in the assembly area. This is one of the few changes and we're gonna do it eventually is I wanna run another branch over here and have a drop cord in this area. I have plugs on the wall, but it's just so much more convenient sometimes to pull a cable down than have stuff laying around on the floor, or have to move things off the wall to get to those plugs. Also, the dust collection is all hard piped in now. As you can see, didn't do a video on that. It's the same clear view I had in the old shop. And I have to say, if you wanna quiet down one of those machines, they're really loud. Just put it in a space that's about four times bigger than where it is, it'll be a lot quieter. It's been a while since I've had to work in an unconditioned space and I'm never doing it again. So I've got these two dual mini splits. They're both 18,000 BTU units and they both have their own compressors outside. The reason I went with two units instead of one unit is it was actually cheaper to do two units than one larger unit with multiple heads. Um, I installed these myself. I'd definitely be wary about doing a DIY install on these kind of units. There's a whole lot involved to it. And I got the Sinville, they've been running great, but the instructions are definitely not user-friendly to someone who doesn't have experience installing HVAC units. If you're super handy, you can probably wade your way through it. Again, you watch that video, judge for yourself if you wanna take one of those kind of projects on. Um, a lot of factors that go into that. But I've been very happy with the performance. One of the nice things about going mini splits over the central HVACs, at least the style I went with, which I think are most common, is they use a DC inverter so the compressor can actually ramp up. Your home unit normally can run at 0% or 100%. So then you get in, prob in problems sometimes where in the summer, if it's over cycling, you can't get enough humidity out of the air and it just causes problems. But these can run at 10%, 20%, 100%, wherever they need in between in order to just constantly be removing the moisture from the air, hold the environment where it needs to and not overstress the machine and run into those issues that come from cycling too quickly. And what was the tack room is now the office. This video came out the week before this video we're talking about right now, the office video. So nothing too terribly exciting here. We have electrical, I have a place to work and to uh, pile crap I don't have a good home for. We've been doing some work outside so tools have been kind of being stored in here. Lots of cabinet space. We got a slop sink, so we got a place to you know, drink water from, as well as a really tall urinal. We can wash our tools, mini fridge, sort of the, the basic comforts. And yeah, it's an office. Like I said, video just came out on this if you wanna know more about it. One tip I have for shops, uh, this setup right here, I had something similar to this in the old shop by the entrance from the kitchen. This is by my front barn door and by the office with the man door that I installed, that man door wasn't there. Uh, when we got here. This is my PPE wall. So as you see, we have lots of tape measures. Always need tape measure when you come in the shop. Also safety glasses live here, ear protection, masks, whatever my boys come in here and wanna hang out, uh, which if I've got the door open, they come in this way or if they come in the office, they know that they're not gonna be hanging out in here without grabbing some goggles or glasses and ears if there's anything loud going on. Highly recommend keeping the stuff you need every time you're in the shop right by the entrance so you never forget and it's right there at hand. You come in, you put it on. When you leave, you take it off, you put it there, and you always know where this important stuff is. Another thing we did that I don't have a video on is expanding this pad. You can see what was clearly the old pad, uh, which when this was a horse barn was perfect for, you know, just unloading feed or hay, whatever you need to get into the, the shop. But for us, especially getting here during the rainy season, it was uh, really aggravating that we were always parking in mud, unloading in mud, walking in mud, tracking mud in there all over the brand new floor. Sure, you saw how much mud uh, we haven't managed to sweep out yet. So expanded this so we have plenty of room to park, load, unload. It's not quite cured yet, so that's why you don't see any cars out here. But uh, this is really nice. It'll also give us a place when I do metal work that I don't want to do in the shop. We have plenty of room to lay out steel, weld, etc. It's nice to have an outdoor space that's flat and hard to work on. Okay, jumping to workflow, I'm very excited and proud about this. We're looking at the front of the barn. On that side of the barn outside is where my lumber racks are going to be. So the idea is we can take material from the lumber racks, bring it in here. I'm going to have some inside lumber racks on this wall. So project going for the next material can go on those racks and be acclimating to the environment in here. But this is my breakdown area. So when we have rough, rough material before it gets milled, we have these adjustable tables, make good work surfaces, have power available, have an air cleaner right above me for whatever mess we're making, and we can do all of our rough breakdown. To facilitate that, these carts are awesome. 
These are also from Husky and they're adjustable height so we can raise them, lower them wherever we need. Obviously we have a project on them right now, um, but the idea is, what's really nice is after we break them down, we can move one over to be an outfeed, then take the other cart with the raw material that needs to be milled. It's an infeed cart. And the way I like to work is jointer first, so we can come through, go through the jointer, do our face joint, comes to the outfeed table. Now it needs to get planed. So the outfeed table becomes the infeed table for the planer. Everything can shoot through the planer. And of course, what was the infeed table is now the outfeed table. Now we have um, two, an S2S board. Both surfaces have been jointed and planed. Now we need to do the edge treatment and slide them back over and shoot them back through the jointer. If we're done with that, instead we can take what's come off and slide it over here and it becomes the infeed for the table saw. And again, you know, what was the infeed at the joiner slides over, becomes the outfeed for the table saw. Everything can shoot through the table saw. And now we have a stack of lumber on carts right here that's all been milled and processed and is ready to go into assembly. Right in front of our assembly area. This is going to be the miter station. I'll get into changes that are gonna happen. Uh, assembly table, etc. We've mostly been doing tables, so we haven't been using this, so it's been a catch-all. But this is the assembly area. You can see we've got the hand tool wall up and the workbench out. So this is where all the joinery can be finessed and you know all the parts start coming together. And then we need space though, once, especially working with a bigger project. Once we got all that stuff together, it can come back over here to where it started, where we have a lot of open room. Right now we got the miter saw station he setting here. We've got the sanding station. Merca sent me out their new cart for my Merca assembly. And we've got the giant sander on here too. This has been absolutely great to have because especially with it on wheels and I use this vacuum for my track saw and several other tools. And it even has storage for all the paper. We also have the clamp rack with all the glues. So in this area, we have our two carts for sanding, gluing, clamping, and all that stuff, plenty of room to work. Then we can bring out the spray system or finish however we're gonna finish it finish it in this area and then it's also right by the doors that go outside to the driveway and the parking pad where it can get loaded onto the truck and go be delivered. If we're doing panels and we need to do panel glue ups, it can come right off out of the assembly area and instead of using the, the Bessie clamps, we can go to the clamp wall and get used here. So just to summarize that, it's a very nice circular flow where material can come in, it can get stored where it comes in, it gets broken down where it comes in, and then it goes through a zigzag pattern where the in feeds and out feeds all line up for the milling process. I did skip the bandsaw, bandsaw lives over there too, so if I need to rip things down to rough width as we go, it's right there by the jointer, um, which is a great place to have it, I've learned so far. And then once we come off the table saw, it goes into our assembly area where you are, uh, where all the joinery can happen, then slide back down into this open flex space where we have movable carts that are adjustable height. We've got the sanding set up. We've got all the clamps. We've got all the glue. We've got the panel clamp wall. And the whole project can come together, get finished, and conveniently right by the door to go out for delivery. So, so far we've done a couple projects and it works just as well as I'd hope. It's so nice versus uh, the old shop where Everything was just where it was to facilitate having as much in-feed and out-feed as possible and just always moving all over the shop. Granted, it was small, so it wasn't very far, but there was definitely no flow organization. In addition to all my patrons, my sponsors for the big part of making this happen. Of course, as you guys know, Total Boat has been sponsored for a while. This beautiful Husky cabinet is kind of my Total Boat cabinet where I have a lot of my stuff that I'm gonna be chewing through a lot of this really soon on some projects. Of course, all my Husky stuff has come from Home Depot. They've been a partner for a while. And with that, there's a few things they sent me I need to talk about that I'm excited about that didn't naturally fit in. So I'm gonna cover that real quick. One that does fit in, of course, is this rolling cabinet, which is really awesome. Slightly different style than the other ones I uh, talked about, but they're also soft clothes and everything, very big wheels. I like this, that has my oscillating spindle sander. There's a few things that they asked me if I wanted and I said yes, that I really wish I had during this build out that would have made things a lot easier. With all the construction, I really wish I'd had a good tool belt. This is a good tool belt. Um, back in my construction days, I used stuff like this and especially with suspenders, it sounds stupid, but man, your hips get real tired, especially if you've got a ton of nails and screws and everything on your hips all day. So tool belt with suspenders is awesome. 
this seems silly. This isn't just a rubber mallet. This is a dead blow mallet, and it's kind of like a maraca. You can hear stuff shaking in there. I wish I'd had this for when I did, did this floor, um, because for some of the stubborn bits that we had to hit, the nice thing about a rubber mallet is the rubber mallet has rebound, so when you gotta do a lot of pounding, it comes back and saves energy. A dead blow mallet is exactly the opposite and very handy to have whenever you really need to put a lot of force into something. The big difference is with all the sand or beads or whatever they have in here, when you hit, there's slop, so it goes forward and there's absolutely no rebound, so all the energy in your hit goes right into whatever you're doing. And there's some really cool videos on YouTube of people making like beautiful versions of these. This is a ready-made option if you don't want to do that. Another thing is a tool bag. I haven't filled this up yet, but during the build out, um, this little bag caused a lot of stress for us because this, as you can see, is still piled full of stuff was what we worked out of. And I was like, when I saw this dude, I was like, that's gonna be so much better. Definitely overtaxed my tool bag and it was not big enough for everything we needed. So this is another Husky option that has, stays open, has all kinds of storage and compartments. And I tell you what, we probably would have been a little less stressed and saved a lot of time digging in that thing for tools if I'd had this from the get-go to organize our tools in until we had the storage, which as you can see, even though I've had the storage for a week or two, it's um, still not quite organized yet. I will get there, I will get there. And of course, huge thank you to Merca. They've been a sponsor for a while, sponsored a lot of projects and content. They've hooked me up with their Sanders sandpaper and this, this cart, if you have room for it, this workstation, so awesome to have, to be able to keep all my sanding stuff together. Uh, Bessie has also provided me a lot of clamps and Rockler, you'll notice there's a lot of Rockler stuff in the shop. They hooked me up with all kinds of stuff to make this shop happen from um, the clamp rack and accoutrement to a whole lot of dust collection, a lot of jigs, etc. And of course, also have to talk about the CNC. I didn't cover this in when I was going through the workflow because it's kind of a, a standalone thing. It doesn't naturally fit into my workflow. I don't use it on every project, but when I do, it's here. I love it. I've got the spool board, been using some cam clamps. Um, the sit to stand desk I have in my office, I have a video out on that. That was the first real project I did on this. The dining table working out right now, which will be out when it's out. We did a lot of work on that on this machine and it has been absolutely amazing to have a CNC of this quality that with this kind of precision and as fast as it'll run in the shop. It's just, it's a game changer, for sure a game changer. And of course, when I work with sponsors, it's not just for my benefit, I try to make sure it's for your benefit too. Sponsors that um, will be of use to you and I try to pass on some of that savings. So these Penguin CNCs, you go to the website, pcncinc.com, get $300 off any machine you find on there with my code below. The total boat, I have a 15% discount code below, TB15YCMT2. I wanna say anything and everything on totalboat.com gets you a discount there. So thank you to everyone who's supporting the channel. And with that, let's get to what's coming next for the shop to finish making it awesome. One of the first things, of course, miter saw has just been living on this table, which has been very handy. Um, we actually moved the miter saw station in here, which you may have seen before if you've been watching the videos, it lived here, but it didn't move very well. It was one of my early projects, very much enjoyed building it, served me well, but I've switched out to all these Husky cabinets that Home Depot provided me with and these are absolutely awesome. I just need to get them all organized and loaded down. And I'm gonna build a top surface for all this that the miter saw can live into. And then I can hook the shop back up to the miter saw and close it. I've already got my dust collection piped in for where it is. Um, we've even got under cabinet lighting here. I'm gonna put some of my wall control panels up here for some storage and I'm super impressed with the quality of these cabinets. Like normally this kind of stuff is super flimsy and you can just twist it and it feels unsturdy. But even the doors on these are soft close. All the drawers are soft close. The cabinets with drawers, I was really impressed. Uh, they were super heavy and I couldn't figure out why they were so heavy until I was putting the feet on them. They have a hundred pound ballast on the bottom. So of course you need to, you know, never open all the drawers and make sure you have your load balance inside of it properly but that way if you haven't got there yet, you don't have to worry about something heavy in the top drawer tipping your cabinet over because you do have 100 pounds of ballast in the bottom. Like just the forethought and quality on that is uh, really awesome. Very happy with these cabinets. Um, I've got a couple more that'll be roving. 
This one has my grinder setting on it right now until I find it at home. My baby bandsaw is going to live on this cabinet to just be wherever it needs to be with, you know, have some storage space. Then I have the other rolling Husky cabinet that has my sander on it right now. It's gonna end up living on the other wall once we get that organized. This is that other wall that uh, a lot of this is just junk I need to go through and get organized. And once that's organized, this is where all my carts are going to live. I'm going to sort of a cart workstation kind of model. I have like workstations set up, but things that uh, don't necessarily have to have a, this is where it has to happen. It's better to bring those to the tool. So it's like, you know, my sanding cart, my cart, my uh, clamp rack, the sanding station, all that. I want to have mobile, so just set it against this wall. So whatever we're doing in the flex space, we can just grab the cart we need, pull it out, work, and uh, go. And to facilitate that same mentality, these adjustable carts, one of the things I want to do is put a bottom on these so I have a shelf and then some of my sustainers and stuff that we use with these carts a lot for breakdown and assembly. So like track saw, jigsaw, uh, the domino, all the dominoes that go with it, all that kind of stuff can live on these carts. So they all stay together so that way when it's time, we don't have to go to cabinets and pull those out. They'll just live in this unused space until we need them, which will almost always be at these tables. So we're beside the barn. This is outside of that other wall where I wanna have all my carts. One of the things I'm really excited about, uh, Home Depot and Husky just sent me this 80 gallon compressor. Um, it's part of the prospective, which a lot of the stuff in there is part of the prospective program. Haven't had an opportunity yet, but this is going to get piped inside and I'll have air throughout the shop at all the stations I, I need. I'll have several hoses and then also some short tails. Um, there will be a video on how I decide to pipe all that in and how I pipe it in. Um, but yeah, that, this is also a what's next thing that's going to be really handy. And in that video, I'll talk about why have air in a wood shop because we don't really use a lot of air tools, but there are some good reasons behind it. Now we're on the other side of the shop. You can see that's the man door we put in that goes into the office. We've been graveling in also as part of my war on mud here, which I haven't done videos on these, but soon, if not already, I'll be launching a homestead channel about all the stuff we do around the, uh, the land here. And my war on mud is gonna talk about the concrete pad and the gravel and some other stuff we're doing a lot more. But what you can see is all these random cinder blocks before we graveled in, we leveled all this off. I've got the steel, just haven't got to it yet. Is going to be building a huge lumber rack for vertical lumber storage out here. That's going to be uh, pretty enviable. Really excited about getting this thing done. And while we're out here, another nice thing, um, we don't talk about this much on this channel. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably know uh, gardening is a huge hobby of mine. So we just finished this morning buttoning up two garden beds that are going to be our for now garden beds. So that video will be coming out soon. I'll have plans on those, but that's what we're gonna use until I can get the soil amended well enough out in the pasture that I can grow a good garden there. And then we'll still keep using these for greens and stuff. But anyway, that video is coming if you like gardening and stuff and want some plans on some raised beds. And my last what's next is sort of an in progress. So we have a TV in the corner. There was another monitor in the office that's tied to my CCTV system, which obviously is for security, but also as part of my video scheme, um, I have four cameras up now. I've got eight more I'm gonna put in place. And the idea with them is to have constant footage being captured so I can go in there and grab time lapses and also have shots that it's hard to get the camera into, like a lot of top-down shots of the milling, of the CNC cutting, of our assembly area. I'll put one in. So hopefully we can have some more dynamic footage and make it easier to move through projects and get the footage we need. So um, not sure how that's gonna work out, because we haven't fully implemented it yet, but uh, I'm real curious to see how that works into the video flow, and that's gonna be quite a bit of fun. Anyway, I hope you learned something, were inspired, or at least entertained. Thank you for coming along on this tour journey. Thank you for helping me make it happen, and until next time, make time to make something.